So welcome to this uh, new episode of Progressive, dealing with the high hot topic at the moment at European level. We had actually an earthquake, a political earthquake in the European Union, which may lead really to a change of the relationship of forces between progressive and conservatives within our continent. It were the local election in Spain around two weeks ago. Uh, obviously, as Progressiva, we will pick up this topic and uh, discuss it today with uh, Henry Keres. Henry works in uh, Valencia in the administration and is uh, politically active. So it's a voice from uh, the political, political reality that we have in the Spanish cities and will help to understand us what happened, what are the implications, and also how did, cha did Spain change over the last uh, five, six years uh, of uh, Sanchez's uh, government. So Henry, thank you very much for being here. Can you introduce yourself and your role um, in, in, in the local policy? Um, so, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Um, so uh, I'm currently serving in, in government as uh, Director General for Ecological Transition, so mainly dealing with renewable energies. And also in the last few months, I've also been serving as, as International Officer for, for Compromise, which is the party that appointed me uh, for my position in government. Yeah, Compromis, that's a good starting point uh, to get deeper into the typical Spanish uh, uh, political situation. What is Compromis? It's a local party, if I understood you well. Um, is it an old existing? Is it new? Um, yeah, what was its role and uh, how could you shape the city? Um, so Compromis is actually a, a coalition of, of three different parties. Um, each party comes from a different uh, let's say political tradition. So some are more uh, pro Valencian rights, other are more um, from a left wing tradition, and, and we also have people coming from an ecologist background. Um, but we formed this coalition, which became like a stable uh, union of the parties in 2011. And we've also been part of the, of the different coalition governments, both in the city of Valencia, city council leading actually the, the local government, and also part of the regional government uh, coalition since 2015. Um, and we will now, after the, the election outcome in 2023, uh, be leaving most of the governments actually. But we have been an important player in terms of progressive coalitions in, in our city and, and region for the last few years. So we will come back to that, but uh, we can already see that the last administrative election has basically led in many places, among them Valencia, to um, a lo a lo to lose the, the progressive majority that were there. Um, how far do you think that this situation of having such a, a strong local party is representative of Spain? Because if I think of Spain, I think of one, this is true for the whole of the European Union, but of a country which contains a lot of plurality, of diversity. If I think of Catalonia and the fights for independence we all know of, but also of the Basque countries and many, many other uh, minorities all over, uh, spread all over the country. So is it something typical of Spain to have local parties with local tradition? And should we understand the Spanish political landscape in this key? Um, definitely, you, if, you, if you're aiming to understand Spanish politics, it's not only just about the left and right axes of politics, but also about the, the territorial diversity. So understanding Spanish different identities is, is, is key to, to understanding how Spanish politics works. In fact, uh, there has always been, as you mentioned, a tradition of certain parties, especially in the Basque country and Catalonia, to a lesser degree, Galicia also has has played a role in this in, in this uh, aspect. Um, but it is it is important, especially because um, there are there are different um, sensitivities, different visions as to how the Spanish state should be organized, and therefore the kingmakers have often been. Uh, these Basque and, and Catalan parties that have actually decided when there has been no clear majorities who the, the president for the whole of Spain should be. Um, so it's a matter of, uh, of, of understanding and that uh, the different views of, of the Spanish state and their different identities, different languages, different cultures, um, trying to integrate those in national politics is what actually uh, can make successful successful political options. 
And speaking of a topic that is uh, actually tackled for sure at the national level, also at the European level, and you were very involved with having this connection between local priorities and also national policy making, and um, you were a director general for the ecological transition in Valencia. Um, could you maybe point out what were the priority, how big the topic of ecological transition has been in Valencia and in, in Spain all over? And also, if you want, what your contribution, your personal, um, your, your personal priorities have been in the last years? So what we've been working on it from my department and, and my, my ministry in general is uh, was mainly on how to deploy um, renewable and clean energies um, in a in a sensible way. So um, we are a party that we, we represent very much um, ecolo ecologist views and, and, and green policies. Um, and obviously we have international commitments to fulfill in terms of reduction of, of gas, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and also improving electrification of our energy system. Um, but there has been an important debate here on how to deploy these and whether we prioritize self-consumption, for example, over um, solar and wind farms. Um, how we gain public and, and community control over large electric companies. And we have been trying to, to implement the system by providing grants, but also trying to organize uh, a, a planning system for, for the deployment of, of renewable energies in the last few months that kind of conjugates these two elements, how to quickly deploy these clean energies without actually having to uh, to sell our territory or to pay off other costs uh, that would be negative for our agriculture, for example, or for uh, the, the maintenance of, of natural resources. So it's been more about uh, not just quickly deploying in just any way, but actually trying to work out the right um, equilibriums to, to make uh, an, an ecological transition that's actually helpful for everyone and not just uh, for the powerful businesses, an ecological transition that's clean, but also protects the environment and protects the natural resources. So we've been working along, along those lines. And let's start from along these lines to explain what happened two weeks ago. So in the last year, we had many progressive majorities. It was the case for the city of Valencia. It was the case for the central government and many other administrations. Well, there were administrative elections. And from what I understood, these majorities get lost, got lost. Um, so following these lines, was it maybe because there was too much green policy or was there too less green policy? Was it one of the main topic or were other topics dominating? Was it the topic of immigration, the one actually dominating the debate? How could it be that uh, um, there was such a disaster results? So I agree with the fact that it has been uh, a general thing that uh, the right wing and the far right have actually had a good result um, and the left and progressive options have, have not performed that well. Now, it's difficult. I mean, you were asking whether it was a matter of uh, too little progressive policies or too much or in terms of green policies or so on. Um, I think it's more about the story and uh, how we've explained what we've been doing. Um, so obviously this last term has been a very complicated term as everywhere in Europe. So we've had the pandemic, we've had the consequences of the of the Russian invasion in, in Ukraine. And obviously that has some uh, some um, election cost and that obviously is, is complicated to, to manage and to deal with. But also I think what has made the, the difference and what has made people shift to their options is actually about the story. So in, we, we have tried, and in general, I'm talking about even national government, we have tried to explain the successes and the good results of our, of our positions in government and our measures, where the debate has actually been more centered on more, um, let's say, sentimental aspects or more, um, uh, le le less specific measures. Um, so um, whilst, for example, Compromis was trying to explain that we wanted to improve health coverage and uh, and improve social um, aspects or, or, or go further in terms of uh, fighting against climate change with specific measures in terms of transport or in terms of energy or whatever, um, the debate on the news was actually on, uh, on um, 
say, uh, terrorism and the involvement of independent and independentist parties and their links with former um, it does a former terrorist organization in the Basque country, or um, or talking about uh, the the consequences of the new rape law instead of talking about specific social measures that we were implementing here. So it's been a campaign more based on feelings, more more based on fears and concerns, than actually on what we have been doing in government to help people's lives. So um, so it's been difficult because I feel that like there hasn't been enough space. And when I when I talk about space, I mean like you know, on the media um, to explain successes or maybe failures or or things we could have done better. Uh, but it hasn't been a, it, it's been a bit of an awkward campaign in that sense because there has been no no room for for actual specific debates in that sense. So this room has been taken by trying to summarize what you said, basically by debates about. Uh local parties having extremists in the rows. You were mentioning ETA politicians so, or former ETA members politicians. So ETA was this terrorist organization of the Basque lands. And then you were mentioning a particular law project that got debated very much. Um, then my question are further two topics that normally play a big role at the moment in Europe are energy prices with respect to the green transition. Um, at least in Germany, this plays a big role at the moment in the debate, and the immigration. Um, were these two topics also dominating, or was it really focused about local uh, extremists and local parties and this role project that you will probably further elaborate now? Yeah, so so I agree. Migration, for example, is another one. But what, what, I, was, what, what I was trying to explain is that it, it wasn't about specific um, measures that contributed to, be, to better people's lives. It was more about a general feeling. So um, how the far right has actually uh, been able to, to dominate in a certain way the public debate by creating the fear that, um, say, migrants are, are taking most of the social benefits. Um, whereas the factual information does not support those statements. It's more about how um, they influence the public opinion rather than actually supporting their measures with specific ideas or specific policies that, that can that can uh, improve people's lives so so it's been a uh, it's been a weird campaign in that sense because um it was very abstract instead of talking about very specific um policy ideas so, so that that that's what's been strange about this campaign and, and and what we need to think as progressives how do we how do, how do we tackle these situations? I mean, if, if you look at the economic figures, like the Spanish economy is actually growing above the EU average. Um, we're having very good, um, very good results in terms of employment, considering Spanish history, which has, which has been particularly bad in that sense. But obviously, the last reform of the of the of the labor legislation has actually been working very positively in terms of improving quality of the marketplace and so um it's been uh it's been um it's it's been strange because obviously the results um do not reflect i believe um our uh, our time in government our our management of the crisis that has been radically different to what we found after the financial um, the financial crisis and recession in 2008 and and it's been it's been a bit weird in that sense We'll go zoom back also to how actually you were saying what changed in the last years of Sanchez. I mean, when the progressive arrived in Spain, it was right after the crisis, after the restrictive economic policies, which actually brought to, to a rise and a flourishing of unemployment. Um, but before, just a question to answer with yes or no from your part. Um, in France, and in Germany, the question of uh, the pouvoir d'achat or that the power, the purchasing power, um, focused on the energy prices that uh, um, rose so much during uh, the last uh, one and a half years, is a dominating and a polarizing debate. You can see it. Then it takes form different forms in Germany now. It's the heat pumps uh, discussion. Um, was it one of the dominating topics? Is it still one of the dominated topics? Or is it more about this emotional feeling of a country going ruined by immigration and by progressive hipster hipsters? Um, just to answer in short, I, th I think it's the latter. It's, it, it's more a sentimental thing. Than okay, the so the latter. Yeah, indeed, it was difficult to answer with yes or no. I formulated it uh, in another way. Um, so... 
Now, just some hard facts uh, to contextualize the situation. We said there was there was actually uh, elections were lost with the administrative uh, administrative election. Why did Sanchez decided to call for new elections? Um, so, uh, from a democratic point of view, I think it does make sense that um, if uh, the progressive, the social democrats, but also in most cases in coalition with other green and progressive forces, um, have actually lost most of the regional power and even local power, um, it does make sense that um, he holds this uh, kind of referendum on his uh, national government at the, at, at the national level. So I think, I think to some extent, it does make sense from a progressive point of view, from a, from a democratic point of view, rather. Um, also, from a tactical point of view, I think that if there was, if there is still, which I believe there is, an option to retain a progressive government at the national level, um, it must be done quite quickly before um, there is a certain opposition of all the regional presidents, pretty much all of the regional pre um, presidents will be will be from the right wing. And also uh, for most of the of the local governments will also be right wing. And so um, if you have this opposition of all the other levels of the of the of the Spanish state working against the national government, I think that's very tricky to to uh, to work out that for the next six months or next yeah, six or seven months, which is when the actual uh, general election was due. And so I think it, it's also a, a clever um, tactical move in, in order to try and, and retain the, the, the Spanish national government for progressive forces. So let's uh, just go back some years, having the overview, then slowly we shall already come to an end, not to um, over uh, over prolong uh, the the meeting. We can also do maybe another one after the election. And um, the fact is, the current government is a coalition government uh, of Podemos, so the far left national party arising from from the protest after the economical crisis, and the PSOE, so the traditional social democratic party led by Sanchez, the the prime minister. And um, is it a majority or is it a minority government? And which other Sanchez governments have there been? Because it's not the first election, actually, since Sanchez became prime minister. And um, how were the, the government's constellation, very briefly, uh, if you can answer this? And which were the main successes which changed Spain in the in these last years? Um, so, um, yeah, actually, it is the, the current government is formed by, by Unidas Podemos, so that's Podemos and their allies, which are... Um, other smaller forces, also, for example, the Catalan allies of, of Podemos, which have their own distinct organization. Um, and uh, they still form, uh, they form a coalition government that's in a minority still, so they still don't have enough parliamentary support. So it is a complex situation, but I think that's positive because we have seen that um, from a progressive perspective, when there are coalition governments that include also left and green parties, um, there are more changes, more reforms, more uh, brave measures that actually contribute more to, to improving people's lives. And that's been the same case here in, in Valencia, both at the local and regional level. And we've seen more, many more cases, say, in, in the Balearic Islands or, or other examples we can, we can mention. Um, so uh, actually, Sanchez, with regards to the first Sanchez uh, government, he got in after uh, he got into power after a, a no vote, uh, a no confidence vote. Um, after the the main conservative party was officially condemned for corruption, so all of the parliamentary parties agreed that there was uh, no time for an election and a need had to be had to be uh, implemented. Uh, a change had to be implemented straight away, and that's how uh, um, Sanchez got into government in the first place. But as soon as there were elections, so one or two years later, um, he didn't have an. Uh, Majority, and he had uh, to to form a coalition government with with Unidas Podemos, and that means that obviously since 2015, the logic of there being two big parties in Spain has very much uh, faded, and that coalition governments are have been necessary. So since 2015, you have seen that no single governments are that 
I wouldn't say any at all, but but they're, they're more and more unlikely, and therefore uh, coalitions have to be formed. I think that's something that the, the Spanish society has been very much normalized in the last few eight to ten years. And so uh, I think that's that's important that that those uh, that that progress in terms of dem democracy and coalition governments has has uh, has actually uh, moved uh, in in the society. Um, maybe what are, in your opinion, the most important reforms that this government could push through? Um, I've heard, for example, of uh, four days work projects, uh, of minimum wage reforms uh, and reduction of, of precary work. How far were these reforms really important and how far were there more formal uh, formal successes that were more words than, than facts? Yeah, sorry, so you, you did ask before. So, um, yeah, so some of the, the most impor important projects have actually been, for example, the, the minimum wage has actually increased by almost 50% in the last term. So that's been a massive, massive uh, change in terms of uh, labor relations in Spain. Also, the reform um, that changed the, the, the rules for, for, for labor relations have, have actually improved the quality of, uh, of contracts and has reduced um, te temporary contracts by a very much significant amount. At, at the same time, unemployment figures have have improved. So, um, so that that's been a very very positive impact both to the economy but also to individuals people's lives. And then also some of the um, feminist measures. So we we there have been a new light new new laws on on LGBT rights and trans rights um, and. Um, uh, and, and yes, yeah, so more more social investment than ever in terms of, for example, um, dependency care, so more more support for people with disabilities, more support for old people. So it has been a, an important government in terms of social progress, um, I'd say. Well, this uh, it is it is interesting to see that even though there was such an improvement for larger pieces of the populations. Um, the topics could be moved from uh, the social economical topics to a more cultural war like uh, topics, which is, I think, a danger um, that in all of Europe is occurring and uh, not to fall into this uh, discussion of cultural war of gender or gendering the changing the language or not and in being in order to be it more uh, more gender correctly. These are important topic, but we should simply do it and then discuss about the real life shaping reforms like the minimum wage reform and not fall into this trap of just running behind the populistic um, topics. I think regarding the populistic topics in Europe, we have just to conclude saying one important um, change that also occurred in the last year. I remember 2019 with the last European election, the PSOE becoming the most important uh, social democrat party in the family of the socialists and democrats in Europe, uh, having a great success. We looked at Spain also as an example of a country where the populistic movement at right was in the right part was not arising. Um, however, this has changed a lot in the last five years. I think of Vox. Um, maybe there are also a lot of local right-wing extreme party um, of which I do not know. Could you elaborate a little bit what, what are the reasons, how far, how, 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 how strong are these parties and do they do coalitions with other democratic parties or are they isolated? Um, so, uh, yeah, as you have very well summarized, the, the political landscape has very much changed. Um, so uh, in terms of the social democratic party, um, I think that uh, there has been a, a change and, uh, and to some extent the Social Democrats have understood in a way that they need to work with other progressive forces if they want to remain in government. So it's not about uh, the former PSOE that tried to occupy the whole left-wing spectrum. Now they, they somewhat, to varying degrees, but they have somewhat understood that it is necessary to cooperate with other uh, left-wing and progressive and green forces in order to, to be successful in government. Um, now, wh why Vox has had a, an important result in the last few years? I think 
um, that relates to the former point we were we were discussing. So it's been more about the cultural uh, debate, the cultural battle, and the and the battle for feelings um, that has that, that's making people uncomfortable. So as you were saying, like if if uh, there is a certain focus on the media on the importance of inclusive language, say, and there are certain parts of the population that feel somewhat threatened by. Um, by their style of life, because um, if people now believe that feminist laws go against, um, you know, go against flirting in a in a nightclub, then people feel somewhat threatened by by what they have always been doing. And so, so it's not about um, about reason; it's more about emotion. And that's a whole uh, new political sphere that I don't think progressives are tackling well. And I think unless we work on that uh, more emotional side of politics. Um, I don't think we'll be successful in the in the elections in the next few years because, um, as we were saying, all the factual information, all the economic figures, all the social measures are clearly improving people's lives. And, and we've seen a decrease in inequalities. We've seen a decrease in poverty. We've we've seen how inflation rates have have decreased from ten percent to we're now at three four percent. Um, and that's still not enough, still not appealing enough, still not convincing enough for um, for society. So it's about the emotion, it's about the cultural battle, um, and we need to rethink, I think, as, as European progressives, how, how to deal with this. Well, I think that was a perfect conclusion for our po uh, podcast with this uh... Um, view over the European progressives uh, next future and how we should shape actually the European campaign which is around the edge it's next year not to forget so uh, Henry I thank you very much for participating giving us some insight about Valencian uh, Spanish and the Spanish perspective over European policy politics and uh, yeah we are looking forward to the campaign electoral campaign in Spain and we hope for a strong results uh, for um, the progressive, meaning green, local, left parties, and of course also the PSOE in Podemos. In this sense, thank you very much. And uh, dear listeners, uh, I hope to hear you, or I hope that we will meet in the sense of you hearing the podcast very soon. And of course, if you want to write us any suggestions, you are very welcome. Mm -hmm.